Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Romans in the New Testament, uh, chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 1 to 10, and it's on page 1139 in the Pew Bible. So Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. This is God speaking to us. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we who are many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Amen. This week has been sort of pressurised, and uh, since I didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare, it occurred to me that it might be sufficient if I were simply to point out these five things that Paul highlighted in this letter to the Romans. You'll find it on page 1139. That's chapter 12, 9 through to 11. And say, well, let's get on with it. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And honor one another above yourselves. So there you go. Uh, Those are the sorts of things Uh, that you've got to do if you want to be good Christians. Uh, Those are the kinds of things that if we do them, uh, that will make us into an attractive congregation. Love sincerely, hate evil, hold on to what is good, be devoted to one another, and treat each other better than you would treat yourselves. So, will you try and do that uh, this coming week? Uh, I am glad because now we can just pray and go home and have an early lunch. Well, I guess if I did that, you would all say, what? Apart from the fact that I ought to get the sack for short changing you through my lack of preparation, I really ought to get the P45 for short changing you with the truth. Because what I've just suggested to you is not only lazy, but it's also worthless moralism. I can no more love sincerely, hate what is evil, cling to what is good, or to be devoted to one another in brotherly love or honor people above myself than I can fly to the moon. And if I can't do those things, why on earth would I want to burden you with those things as well? Now, my job is not to see what's the least amount of work I can possibly do. 
nor is my job to heap more depends, uh, demands upon your shoulders than you can physically or emotionally cope with. My job is to present the gospel. That is the important responsibility that I have. It is the sharing of good news. And the good news is this, that while chapter 3 verse 10, we've learned that there's no one righteous, no, not one, and while we have learned in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and while we know from chapter 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death, while all of that is undoubtedly true, yet there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, chapter 8, because Jesus has done for me something that I could never ever do for myself. He has justified me freely by His grace through the shedding of His own blood on the cross. So, in spite of my hopeless condition, because of the cross, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord. Now, chapter 12, verse 1. Since all of that is what Jesus has done for me, rescued me, justified me, saved me, what is the only right and the only appropriate response that I can possibly give back to God? And the answer is offering myself wholly to God as a living sacrifice. That's the right thing to do. Some of you have been watching the series on BBC Two on Monday nights uh, about surgery. It's called Surgeons on the Edge of Life or Surgeons at the Edge of Life. And it's both fascinating and gruesome at the same time. Uh, it showed one patient who had gone through, I think it was 10 hours of intricate heart surgery. Uh, and then it showed him meeting the surgeon and the patient could hardly speak for sheer gratitude. The surgeon hadn't said to his patient prior to his surgery, now I want you to try really hard. I want you to run even longer in that treadmill and jump higher. That would have been preposterous. Imagine saying to a sick man, do better, try harder, when what the patient needed was a new heart. But having received his new heart, then the joy, the delight, the freedom, and the response of the recipient was that of sheer gratitude and thankfulness. Therefore, in the light of all that you have done for me, this is the appropriate response. Some of you, by the way, might enjoy working your way through Paul's letter to the Romans, and every time you come across the word, therefore, underlining it in the text, it'll be very interesting to see how many you find. Let me give you a head start. Uh, here are three of them of the most important ones. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Romans 8, verse 1, and now Romans 12, verse 1. In the light of everything that God has done for me, what is the appropriate response that I might make to God? And the answer is, even as God has loved me with sacrificial sincerity, so with the Holy Spirit's help, I want to seek to love God and other people in a similar sort of way. And even as Jesus hated evil and loved what is good, so now with his power, I want to reflect his nature and character in the way I live. It's not try hard and do your best. Rather, it is now that God in his mercy and at such great cost to himself has done this for me, now united to him, enable me, dear Lord, in his strength 
and his enabling power so to live. I wonder if you find it as interesting as I do that this set of injunctions immediately following uh, comes after teaching on spiritual gifts. Last week, Drew uh, reminded us of the passage about the gifts which God gives his people to make a worthwhile and good functioning congregation. And immediately following that teaching, here we we see uh, the first word in verse 9. It, it is love. Love must be sincere. And that's exactly the same as in another of Paul's letter uh, to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 12, there's a whole lot of teaching about spiritual gifts. And chapter 13 is the great chapter about love. So, in the light of all the good things that God has given to us to enjoy and for the benefit of others, how then should I love? Live, and the answer is plain. It is to do as Christ did, to love sincerely, to hate what is evil, to cling to what is good, to be devoted to one another in brotherly love, and to honor one another above yourselves. It was suggested um, by somebody at the prayer time on Wednesday night that now in our society that we no longer hurt each other with our fists, that we've resorted to hurting one another with our words. There's some truth in that, isn't there? It's a sobering thought. Well, you see, that's not loving sincerely. That's not hating what is evil. That's not clinging to what is good. A couple of weeks ago, my, my son Robert and I were in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there we were reminded of that scene in the Gospels when Judas, Jesus' disciple, approached his master and betrayed him with a kiss. And I wondered, why did G Judas do that? If he was going to... Um, betray Jesus, why did he not simply point over at him to the soldiers and say, that's him over there? Why did he have to pretend to love him by embracing him? And then immediately following that, as if by total and absolute contradistinction, you remember Simon Peter in his anger and in, in his I won't say it. <laughs> Impetuosity, thank you. After he sliced off the right ear of Malchus, the servant of the Jewish high priest. Do you remember Jesus said, none of this, that's not appropriate. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, the contrast between Judas using a kiss to mask his true intentions and Jesus loving with sincerity of heart, it is total. It's complete. And so we're told to love sincerely and hate what is evil, clinging instead to what is good. Um, sometimes people get nervous about that word hatred. Uh, Christian people aren't supposed to hate, are they? And so, for example, when a passage such as Ecclesiastes 3 is read at a funeral or a wedding, uh, they get nervous. Uh, there's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for war and a time for peace. And, and they say, oh, no, that's not nice. But C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity does not want us to reduce by one atom the hatred we feel for cruelty and treachery. It is right that those within whom God's Holy Spirit dwell, it is right that we should feel with intensity the hatred of things that are wicked and evil and unjust. It is right that those who own the name of Jesus should feel with pain a deep loathing of nastiness and duplicity and dishonesty. In recent weeks, there's been a lot of talk in the media about fake news and it brought to mind those sobering words in Isaiah chapter 5. Woe to those, says the prophet, who call evil good and good evil, 
who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And that, by the way, is what I believe is meant by the unforgivable sin that is mentioned in Mark's gospel, chapter 3. Uh, within that context, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus had been, had been doing wonderful things. He had been healing people. He had been delivering people. He had been doing good. And the teachers of the law, seeing what he did, accused Jesus of doing evil in the devil's name. And, and that's what the Lord Jesus went on to describe as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, attributing to Satan the work of God, calling good evil. Where can you go with that? That's unforgivable because it is so perverse. It is utterly twisting the truth. It is incredibly wicked. And so we're told to hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And then finally in Romans 12 verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves. James Philip writes these words, the Christian church is the one place on earth where it should be possible to trust one another's love and loyalty without being hurt. That's quite a comment, isn't it? The Christian church is the one place on earth where it should be possible to trust one another's love and loyalty without being hurt. Gill, in his Bible exposition, puts it plainly this way. Saints should speak honorably of one another and discouraging and discourage whisperings, backbiting, and innuendos. They should treat each other with honor and respect, setting each other an example. Well, there we go. In the light of everything that Jesus has done for me, in the light of everything that Christ has done for you, it's not just over to you, now get on with it. Yes, Love must be sincere. We are to hate what is evil. We are to cling to what is good. God wants us to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. We are to honor one another above ourselves. But these are not orders. They're not human instructions encouraging us to pull up our socks or to try harder. Rather, set free by Christ filled with the Holy Spirit, this is how we as the people of God are liberated to love. At Christmas time, I picked up a book by Sir Ranulph uh, Fiennes, the renowned explorer, and it's called My Heroes, Extraordinary Courage, Exceptional People. And one of the characters he chose to write about was an English woman by the name of Gladys Aylward, sometimes called the small woman. I had heard of Gladys Aylward, but had absolutely no idea the astonishing details of this remarkable working class domestic from North London and her call to go overseas as a missionary to China. Having spent her life savings to travel by train to China across Siberia and detained by the Russians, she took a lift from a Japanese ship and eventually arrived in a remote Chinese location. And there she immediately got stuck in with caring for the poorest of the poor and traveling the countryside to help enforce a new law against foot binding among young Chinese girls. During her life, this single, small woman adopted many orphans. She intervened in prison riots. She robustly advocated prison reform. 
And when the region where she lived was invaded by Japanese forces in 1938, she led over 100 children to safety over a mountain range, despite being horribly wounded herself. And many, many people trusted in Jesus as a result of her life and witness. And reading that story about Gladys Aylward, these words from our text leapt from the page. For modeling her life upon the Christ Jesus was a living, breathing illustration of Romans 12, 9 and 10 in action. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love and honor one another above yourselves, not because you have to, but because there's no alternative. Not because we will be accepted and loved by God if we choose to live in this way, but because we choose to live in this way because we have been accepted and loved by Christ. Now may that be our wholehearted desire. Shall we pray? Oh, our Heavenly Father, we bless you that you never ask of us what Jesus has not already done for us. And so in the light of the gospel, will you help us to live lives that illustrate such good news for the glory of our Savior? The grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.